So my last Half-Life video covering all the ports did pretty well, and I heard from so many of you guys in the comments telling me that I missed Half-Life on the Dreamcast. So I thought it was time to cover the Dreamcast port. I already knew about the Dreamcast version beforehand, but never really gave it a deep dive that I feel like it deserves. In case you've never heard of it, I'll give you a quick summary. Half-Life was originally planned to be released on the Dreamcast back in the early 2000s, with Blue Shift originally being a campaign designed exclusively for the Dreamcast, sort of like Decay is on PS2. Despite famously having Prima guides printed out and a huge marketing push, the game never saw release. The game was shelved I think even less than a few months before launch, and never saw print. It's pretty funny how people just treat Half-Life on Dreamcast as a, an official port, but it never came out anywhere. Half-Life wasn't the only game that met the same fate though. It's worth noting that dozens of Dreamcast games were also put on ice following the announcement that Sega was getting out of the console business. Since then, multiple versions of Half-Life on Dreamcast have been leaked, and they're basically finished. You can play the entirety of Half-Life on your Dreamcast right now, as long as you set sail for a little bit. Yarhar. So I did what any sane man would do, I ordered a pack of CDRs, ran it through an old disk drive, and now I have a copy that runs on Dreamcast. If you're familiar in any way with this sort of thing, it's not that hard to figure out. And after that's all said and done, you've got a game that runs natively on your original Dreamcast. The main reason people still bring it up is because it does have some small interesting differences that we'll go into in the rest of the video. With all that stuff out of the way, let's take a deep dive into Half-Life on Dreamcast. It's thinking. The most noticeable thing about Dreamcast Half-Life are the graphical changes. The game uses Half-Life's HD style models, which were originally created for the Dreamcast version. Most enemies in the game look a little different, especially alien enemies like headcrabs. Some enemies like the Hound Eye have small but really significant changes like having bony spines on their backs. A few small things I noticed were the different looks for the headcrab zombies, and bull squids have blue spots instead of the usual colors. I think they're cool changes, but they really don't mean that much in the long run. While it's cool to have these polished up characters, the improved graphics come at a really steep cost. The FPS in this game is super choppy and all over the place. Lots of sections with more than a few enemies completely tank the frame rate. And the game chugged really hard from basically any explosions. The NPCs are really like the bane of the frame rate. At a lot of points, the game can outright stall. Anytime I decided to launch an SMG grenade, it would freeze. I think this could have something to do with the age of my system, but I don't really have any similar issues to this on other games. This right here, like this is the old. Yeah, this is Barney from the original game, and Barney was really. He looks cool. kind of dead looking. <laughs> well, the that's, 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 that's The game is also incredibly dark at times. I think the draw distance for the flashlight is significantly reduced, meaning that when you're in a small vent or something that's really dark, you can't see four feet in front of you. The darkness I thought was originally my HDMI converter for my Dreamcast, but playing it on a CRT was actually only so much better at points. It's sort of also just on Half-Life anyway, because there are parts in the game that get super dark, but when I play through the game on PC, I almost never notice these problems. Look at the side by side and you'll see what I mean. The loading times are atrocious, and they're probably my biggest problem with the game. Not only does the game add extra loading screens, but some of those load screens can be up to 30 seconds or more. I guess it's a good time to check my phone or something. <laughs> But honestly, I find that most of the time when you play a game with bad performance, sooner or later you kind of just adjust to it, like your mind gets used to the frame rate or the performance in general. I mean, I used to play Left 4 Dead on like 480p just to get it to run, so maybe that's just how it is. <laughs> it's sort of like playing the Xbox version of Half-Life 2 or playing Doom on a Nintendo Switch or something. And when I went back to the original Half-Life to capture some footage, it was like I was flying through that game. The graphics and performance can give you a lot of problems in Half-Life on Dreamcast, but the biggest hurdle I faced playing Dreamcast Half-Life was nothing to do with the performance and all to do with the controls. This all looks phenomenal. My god, what are you doing? This game runs about as well as it controls, which is to say, not very well. I was actually so glad to have the hazard course levels to actually acclimate to the control setup because it's really strange. The Dreamcast controller is lacking a lot of the buttons that you would typically use for a PC game, and it really shows. You have to do half of the actions by holding the left trigger as an action modifier, instead of just a button. 
So whereas in later versions of Half-Life, you had an extra two shoulder buttons, you just simply don't have that luxury. Move and look are flipped from the get-go, and the Y-axis is flipped by default too, making movement and aiming feel backwards if you're used to modern controls. Most of the jumping, crouching, and flashlight are all on the D-pad. And since the D-pad was both crouch and use, I'd often try to click a button and crouch accidentally. The whole time I played the game, ladders were my biggest enemy. Ladders are already bad enough in Half-Life, and climbing them on a Dreamcast controller where every slight movement of the analog stick throws you wildly in different directions, it can be really tough. Every time I climbed a ladder, I would fly off to the left because my hand would just slightly be moving that way. The controls really made Half-Life on Dreamcast a lot harder than it needs to be. And I can hear you guys typing in the comments, oh, just use a Dreamcast mouse, it supports the keyboard. But realistically, nobody has those things. So here's what I did. The first thing I did was swap the stick and face buttons to be something that's more modern, with the left stick being move and the face buttons being aim. I moved things like reload, crouch, and jump to be shift modifiers for the face buttons, so that when you're moving and jumping, it felt more like the Half-Life ports on later consoles. The way that my aiming was mapped to face buttons did make me look like a weird fidgety robot, but it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. So next up was to save my control setup and move into the main game. You're alive. Thank God for that hazard suit. I'm so a quick side note, the save system in Half-Life Dreamcast is really unoptimized. It kept asking me every time I wanted to save to delete previous save data in order to make space. And this is because of the way the save data works. The save data is based on how much information you've saved per chapter. So you might start a chapter with a reasonable 23 blocks and end it with over 110. With over 100 plus blocks on a save data, that's like five times something like Sonic Adventure. It's a bit of a struggle to handle all the save data, but I guess it comes with being an unreleased game. But at the same time, the build I played was the last one released and was so close to the launch of the game, meaning it was probably going to ship with this terrible save system. I can't verify for sure that this is what the game would have shipped like, but I feel like it's pretty unacceptable for a finished product. Just going through the hazard course and messing around with the save files, the game is already really rough and you can tell. But I decided when I started this video that I wanted to complete the full campaign. So let me take you through that. Half-Life on the Dreamcast is cool because not only does it have the old Half-Life game, which we've all grown to love, but it also has a completely new adventure, all in the same game! Game! Yeah! I was so uncomfortable with the controls at first that I didn't even want to attempt playing the game on normal, let alone hard mode. The first thing I noticed when I played the game was that you can move during the tram sequence, which you can't really do on the PS2 version. I also immediately felt how many loading screens there are. It felt like there were at least triple the load screens from the original game. As you enter Black Mesa in Anomalous Materials, there's loads of these loading screens, but the general idea was the same. Just one of those days, I guess. After getting used to the controls, grabbing the HEV suit, and moving through, I bore witness to the Resonance Cascade, and I almost died falling off the ladder. But after that, it was pretty simple to take the elevator out and get back to the main area of Black Mesa. Office Complex is when I first came to terms with how dark the game gets. Some of the sections, like the starting hallway, are so incredibly dark that it felt like if I hadn't already played the game, I'd be at a loss. And I knew that this is how it's going to be for the entire playthrough. Getting used to the aim assist was also something that took a while, because it doesn't work the same way as it does on the PS2. On PS2, the thing immediately locks onto targets and just is like an aimbot. But on Dreamcast, it sort of glides your cursor toward any enemies in range, and it really doesn't work very well. A lot of times with small enemies like headcrabs, I absolutely had to crowbar them because it would just be impossible to aim with the pistol. Hello. In We Got Hostels, I could barely hit the mines because of the way that the aiming works. Partially my fault due to swapping the control and movement, but it was a sacrifice I had to make in order to make the rest of the game playable. Speaking of controls, I realized that custom controls are set to save data, and for some reason when I turned my console off and came back later, my controls were deleted and I had to remake them. They're coming for us! It's our own- When I got to Blast Pit, I did feel like I was starting to get used to the control scheme, 
And it's gotten to the point where ladders and falling were by far my most dangerous enemy. When I got to this point, all I could think of was, what am I going to do when I get to Zen or the other platforming chapters? Another funny thing I noticed was that the weapon select won't go away until you press fire, no matter what. Just a few moments later, I was really struggling in the section with the fan. Turning on the fan and then having to quickly run up the ladder was nearly impossible. I had to create a strategy where I would face the button, hit it, and then back straight up like a car and go up the ladder that way. Because every time I would try to turn around to hit the ladder, I would be misaligned and fly off and die. Honestly, I was having such difficulty with the fan sections and all the platforming and blast pit that I was really happy to see the tentacle go. Only to be faced with the darkest tunnel known to man. I fell through here five or six times just trying to find the way to the puddle at the bottom. At this point, I really missed having an autosave feature. I find myself constantly saving anytime I run into a ladder or a big pit because I'm worried I'm just gonna slip right off and then die and be stuck walking all the way back. I thought it'd be fun to compare the speed of me playing Half-Life on Dreamcast and playing Half-Life on PC. So here's a quick comparison of me getting from the start of Blast Pit to the tentacle. So at first it might not seem that bad, but I did cut out any sort of saving sequences, and the saving does add a lot of time. But mostly you can see here how much the load times and little inconveniences from the controls get in the way. What? Obviously this isn't anything scientific, but like I said, I thought it'd be fun. Oh, and also, the PC clip is running at half speed. Power Up was a pretty straightforward chapter. After the introduction of the Gargantua, some Vortigaunt got stuck in a hallway and was just standing there menacingly. It's been a pretty common thing in this game to see NPCs sort of mess up their actions. I don't know if that's tied to the performance issues or the game, or maybe I'm just doing something wrong and this would happen on the PC version too, but I just feel like I noticed these things a lot more on the Dreamcast version. Also this part right here where I turn around the corner and they're supposed to blow up the explosives, I swear I had like three frames to react to that. Once I took care of the Gargantua, it was off to On a Rail. By the time I got to On a Rail, I felt like I was pretty much fully acclimated to the control scheme. The auto-aim system isn't nearly as precise as on the PS2, and it feels like some of the time it actually just makes things worse. It felt like things like the SMG were a lot more useful than things like, say, the shotgun or the crossbow. Just because the SMG had a medium range where things were not too close, where the auto-aim would actually get to work, but not too far where things like the crossbow would just completely not help at all. I actually couldn't even tell if the crossbow had auto-aim. It seems to not really work unless you stop shooting as well. If you're, say, like, shooting at something with the SMG, and you stop, it'll take a moment to refocus and then you can keep shooting with the SMG. It's not even close to the infinite range super focus that you get in the PS2 version. I found the trick was to kind of spray a little bit, wait a minute, spray a little bit, and then that would let you kind of track enemies from a medium range. Getting too close to things felt like a mistake most of the time because the auto aim just wouldn't help you out. So I found a lot of the times I would actually just end up using the Glock or the Magnum. At the end of the chapter, when you're releasing the rocket, I found a glitch in the wall. And for some reason, the skybox seemed super blue, and I just kind of hung out for a bit. I don't know if it's that much different, but I thought it was neat. When I got through to apprehension, I just immediately died. The lag on the controller and the speed of the vehicle made it feel like I couldn't even move and I just died immediately. In apprehension, the darkness returned in full force, plus the original Half-Life water is completely opaque and I couldn't see anything. It's crazy to me how the flashlight will just straight up not do anything on some surfaces and it's almost like you're pointing the flashlight at like something painted Vanta black. And this little section with three simple jumps must have taken me like 20 minutes. You know what though, despite all the complaints so far, I was actually still having good time. Half-Life is Half-Life, and this point in my notes I wrote down, this game is still fun. And it's true, even with these terrible circumstances. Coming to a Dreamcast near you. 
I've got to say, the Black Ops were impossible to aim at, but it's a good thing I had bombs. Also, when I got thrown into the garbage compactor, I got bugged out on my save data. For some reason, it just wasn't working. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't load my new save or anything. I just died and got stuck. It's probably my fault, though, for trying to steer it. I gotta say, residue processing was probably the most time I wasted in a chapter. These controls really make you feel the number of platforming segments in Half-Life 1. And I always forget how much the original Half-Life has. Trying to balance on these thin little conveyor belts while they're moving you around was not great. At least I went through that and moved on to questionable ethics, which is a great level. When I got to Questionable Ethics, I was actually really excited. It's a lot of fun to explore the labs and see all the experiments that they were doing on the Zen creatures. At this point, I was starting to think that the lag spikes might not only be the game, but also my Dreamcast. But it's really hard to tell. This guard decided it's time to open the crab vault and unalive himself. See, it's a good thing I'm on easy mode because these guards would really shred you if you let them. And I just don't have the mechanical skill with this control scheme. If you want an example of how bad the load zones can be, I exited the lab, loaded, shot two guys, and then hit another load screen. Next up, it's time for the big boy, Surface Tension. Surface Tension is probably the most iconic Half-Life chapter, and I had a good time with it. Getting through the enemies on the cliff sides presented a bit of a challenge, especially because I was kind of low on health at this point, so I had to play it pretty safe. But every time I ran into a ladder, the same issues would come up and I would slip right off. Catch me saving after every ladder. Well, I don't remember exactly what to do in the mine section, and I can't dodge them very well with these controls anyways. So I'm just gonna climb up on my own mines here and leave. Oh, my first crash. Fun, fun. For a while there, I was thinking that I wasn't gonna have any of these problems, because I did hear that the game can crash from time to time, but at this point, I didn't even think it would happen. I took a break and I came back right before Forget About Freeman, and when I died partway through the chapter, the game loaded straight to the start of the game and I got so scared. But it turns out it just does that if you click load last save, and you haven't made save data during that session. I always felt like this chapter could have taken some parts out of surface tension, because it feels so short compared. Man, the snarks are impossible to target with the controller. If you played Half-Life 1 on Dreamcast or PS2 without auto-aim, you're a better gamer than I am, I guess. <laughs> So by the time I got to Lambda Core, it felt like things were going pretty well. The first half wasn't so bad. I remember having trouble on this part the first time I played Half-Life, but I was actually doing alright. But I was really worried about those portal sections. I built the glue on gun, but I just can't bring myself to use it on a living creature. When I got there, it felt like I would get punished for picking the wrong portal and stuck in the load screen. The flying alien controllers were also quite a bit of a challenge to hit as well. I probably could have just used a different gun though. And next up was Zen. I took a break from playing the game before coming back to the Zen chapters, but after struggling through a few platforming sections, it wasn't so bad. Thankfully, Zen is lacking ladders. Generally speaking, I struggled with a few platforming sections and had an easy time with Gonark. Gonark fight on easy mode, he's got like no health, so it wasn't too bad to just load him up with rockets and move on. I got to Interloper, and honestly, the Zen sections are pretty short in general. Bottomless pits and thin pathways gave me some trouble, but it wasn't too bad. I expected the darkness on the Zen chapters to be a problem for me, but it never reached the levels of, say, like the end of Blast Pit. I expected darkness to be more of an issue, but it wasn't too bad. Just very red. 
The elevator in Interloper was making me feel sick, though. I always liked the design of Zen. It's too bad that these chapters never got fully fleshed out. But I don't think they're as bad as people say they are. When I got to the Nihilanth, the boss was actually pretty easy. I remember when I first played this game and it took me forever because I didn't know exactly what you're supposed to do and you would just keep teleporting me places, but it's actually pretty easy to just cheese it now. It was pretty funny though because after his head was open, I chucked a few bombs from the SMG, fell right down to the bottom of the pit, looked up, and he was dead. Half-Life isn't really known for its boss fights. I realized after the fact that I probably could have beat the game on normal or hard mode, but the added load times of dying in combat, plus dying in pits and stuff, probably would have added an extra hour or two. And that was my experience with the full campaign on Dreamcast. But this game comes with a little extra content, namely Blue Shift. Do you have to play through the original Half-Life to get to your game first? No, actually you can play them both uh, at any time you want to. There's probably a lot of uh, fans of Half-Life uh, that played it on the PC that will probably be getting this just to, to, just to, to play, play the with the new game. stuff, right? Sure. So, you know, we, we, we don't want to force them to play Half-Life again if right. they just want to skip to the new stuff. Blue Shift was originally developed exclusively for the game, like I mentioned before. Blue Shift is a lot of running around in levels that feel a lot like Office Complex and Surface Tension that you feel like you've already been in. Barney doesn't even get access to a lot of the cooler weapons. Good morning, Gordon. It is fun to see characters doing their thing as you're sort of sitting on the sidelines. My main takeaway from Blue Shift was that the level design feels like it's a lot more accommodated to the HD model pack, and it does feel like it's meant more for the Dreamcast. I did also notice that when you break certain boxes open, there are copies of Half-Life Dreamcast discs and VMUs in the debris. This is probably also in the main Half-Life campaign, but I only noticed it when I started playing Blue Shift. Don't tell anyone I'm down here. I think they're trying to kill us all. Blue Shift is fun for what it is, but it's not really that interesting. And I always preferred Opposing Force, which was the other PC expansion. I also found an ISO for Opposing Force as a mod for the base Dreamcast Half-Life. I burnt it to a disc and threw it in my Dreamcast, and I was a little disappointed to find it was super buggy with lots of missing models, but pretty cool nonetheless. Opposing Force is just a lot more interesting since you're playing as the army and you get a lot more unique weapons and enemies, and it feels like more of a new campaign instead of some bonus missions tacked on to increase sale value, like in Blue Shift. Maybe if I have more time in the future, I'll come back and mess around with this version of Opposing Force, but it's so buggy that it kind of ruins the experience. We've been having problems all over the facility this morning. System crashes, security malfunctions, it's a wonder this whole place hasn't shut down yet. So throughout my time with Half-Life on Dreamcast, I couldn't stop thinking, should this have even been released? Like, hypothetically, it couldn't have saved the Dreamcast. It would have sold poorly, and depending on how much they improved from this version of the game I played, I think the PS2 port would blow it out of the water. I could see Half-Life Dreamcast becoming some sort of collector piece in a world where it comes out in 2001. But I would have loved to see Half-Life come out on other consoles at the time, like the GameCube or the Xbox. But I guess at that point, it was considered too last-gen. As fun as it is to think about Half-Life Dreamcast, after going through the entire campaign, I think it's less fun to actually play it. It's hard to imagine the folks who put all the time and effort into making this game happen, and then to see that it never even made it out to store shelves. But despite all of its issues, the core of Half-Life is still there and it's still one of the best games ever made. Half-Life Dreamcast is a fascinating case of a game being right at the gate and failing to launch. As a fan of Half-Life, I'm glad to say that I've played through the entire thing, but it may be best to leave it as a little cliff note in the history of the Dreamcast and Half-Life. I hope that you enjoyed the video. If you liked it and you made it this far, feel free to subscribe and let me know what you think about the Half-Life port. Have you played it? I feel like most people probably wouldn't even bother to sit through the entire game. Do you think they should have released it back in the day? Then let me know if you've ever played this version of the game, maybe even just to try it out. Well anyways, thanks again for watching.